Here. Councilmember Pitts. Here. Councilmember Basil Baker. Here. Councilmember Alts. Here. Mayor Craig. I'm here. Um, I heard from Councilman Ortiz. He will be here, but he's running a little late. So if we could please have a motion to excuse him and Councilman Pierce. So moved. Or a motion and we have support. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion carried. We have a spot on our agenda now, and we have a spot on our agenda at the end of the meeting for public comments. So if anyone would like to address the council, let me do so now or at the end of the meeting. Would you just please state your name for the clerk? My name is Paul Winsley. Uh, my wife and I are the owners of the Ponds uh, Destination uh, venue here in town. And uh, we're here to specifically talk about or make a few comments about uh, uh, point number 11 that will be addressed a little later, which is the noise ordinance consideration. So our venue, uh, in the last two years alone, we, we've got quite a draw. We're getting people, brides and grooms from uh, all over the state in the, into Indiana, uh, Clinton Township, Grand Rapids, Fort Wayne, uh, uh, to come see Adrian all over. So we, we've got quite an impact in the local business, or having quite an impact on several local businesses, hotels, restaurants, uh, retail, and such. So. We're not here to object about the concern of the noise ordinance, but rather just some of the wording um, that's being considered a little bit later on. So for the last nine years, you know, we've really looked at how we run our business and the, the way that we interpret the ordinance is that by the hours of 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., it's kind of quiet time, which we, which we always observe and always have, and we continue to do so. Um, so we, we promptly end the music uh, the, from DJs and things like that at 11 p.m. So the concern that we have and the wording uh, that's being considered a little bit later on, I think it leaves it open for both law enforcement as well as uh, as well as uh, just people in town to uh, to consider what is what is acceptable to them. And, and what I mean by that, it says uh, I'll, I'll read this. It says. Uh, or any musical instrument in such a manner or with such a volume, particularly between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. So that word particularly really leaves it open for interpretation by both the law enforcement to say, okay, is this, is this a problem or is it not a problem? Uh, uh, because it's really not being very specific about the time. Later on in point C, when it talks about shouting and whistling, it is very specific about that time. Uh, but then I would also have concern with um, after it specifies that time of 11 p.m. to 11 or 7 a.m. He goes on to say, or at any time or a place as to unreasonably annoy or or disturb the comfort. So again, it's very it's very open for interpretation. So if my music annoys somebody at, at 8 p.m. at my venue, I'm subject to a misdemeanor. So I, I'm really a, to that, but again, not objecting to the need for a noise ordinance, just the word that's being considered later on. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate the comments. Any other public comments at this time? Hi, my name is Deborah Hannon, and I'm here. It's kind of a ridiculous thing about um, garage sale signs. Um, I know that Mr. Fickle has more important things to do than to run around town collecting garage sales signs. I was just wondering if there's somehow there could be an ordinance or something where you could post garage sales signs, maybe like they have to have the address, the date, the times that they're supposed to be up, and if they're not removed, then take them. But now I guess you can't have them anything off the property. And I was just thinking, where I came from in Pennsylvania, um, they had a thing where you paid $10, you got two garage sales signs, you didn't have to use those two. Then they turn them back in and give you your $10 back. Which I don't think you need to go to that extent, but it would be nice if you could pay like a $10 permit fee and place you know, things up there. And if you don't comply with it, then they take them and take them down. But you know, Mr. Fick would have a sign saying, you know, X amount of give it, permit for this date for this address. And if it's not on there, then he knows the sign should be taken down. They pay $10 for a permit. If you had 100 garage sales, I have no idea how many in the city, probably more than that. That would, you know, give you $1,000. That could pay for Mr. Fickle's gas or some other things in the city. 
And I just think probably 95% of people's garage sales money is spent here in the community. So I just kind of thought I'd bring that to the attention of the council. I appreciate it where by our rule we're not we we're not allowed to engage in debate, but there are two planning commission members here and I will tell you the planning commission is looking at a variety of ordinances to see if things can be adjusted or not. So we appreciate your comments and we'll take them under consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other public comments at this time? Seeing <coughs> none, we'll move to our consent agenda. These are items that we consider to be routine. We take them in one motion unless someone up here or someone in the audience wants to be moved for further discussion or clarification. Tonight on our consent agenda, we have our minutes of July 22nd, DEA minutes of June 26th, our monthly financial reports for June, police activity report for the second quarter of 2019. <coughs> memo for me regarding a board appointment, a recreation of the department fall activity guide, a letter from Karen Kiss, advisor of Coldwater High School Student Council requesting permission to hold the homecoming parade on September 27th, and our neighborhood services third ward sidewalk condition report. Uh, does anyone in the audience want any further clarification on anything? Anyone up here? And we would love a motion to approve our consent agenda. So move. Support. We have a motion and support. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Are they opposed? Consent agenda is approved. Uh, number nine, bills and accounts, $461,514. Uh, as always, detail available on the web for anyone to look at, including us. Questions for Todd or Keith or anybody? I would just note that nearly 300000 of that was in two payments, one for the city's insurance to MML, and one as the first um, initial large payment for the South Jefferson Street reconstruction project. <coughs> Three quarters of that is just in those two bills. Any other questions? Not a motion to pay our bills? So move here on to support that. We have a motion, we have support. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Very close. Motion carried. Number 10, City Manager Report. Keith. Thank you, Your Honor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to recognize those interns that have worked for the city and the BPU over the past summer and all the work that they've done and appreciate their uh, time and talents. Emily Zamansky worked in the Neighborhood Services Department. She's going to Western as a grad student. Cam Miller who worked in the city manager's office, who attends Hope College. Uh, Casey Washburn, who uh, worked in the recreation department and attends Central Michigan University. Uh, Samantha Poole, who uh, worked in the IT department and attends Michigan Tech. And Zechariah Hollis, who uh, worked in the engineering department and attends Trine University. And they all did a good job for, uh, for, for those departments uh, on behalf of the city. And we'd like to uh, thank them for their time and uh, wish them success in their futures. Secondly, we'd like to uh, acknowledge a local, uh, the, uh, an observant local resident who notified the city of a small hole forming in the uh, middle of Marshall Street about a week ago, or no, about a week and a half ago now, but uh, upon investigation that became a very large project. So we replaced a storm sewer manhole on Marshall Street that was a result of a washout um, and so soil washing out from underneath that structure in the roadway. So. The city contracted for that work and now the road has been repaired and repaved and is back in service. But we appreciate the, the timely reporting of that, which leads into the next item on the manager's report and also another example, if you're following social media today, of a um, hornet's nest on Cutter Avenue. Um, there is a way, aside from Facebook, there is a way in which uh, we ask residents to report things in which they think it should be addressed by the city and we have a request tracker um, app or uh, ability in which that uh, residents and customers can uh, report things that need to, be a need to be completed or brought to our attention. So we just ask that uh, residents or customers uh, utilize that means by which to, um, to notify us of something, whether it is a, a hole in the road or a pothole or is a is a hornet's nest up in a tree that, um, that they can get our attention and bring it to our attention and we can schedule it for um, an investigation or repair uh, from that system. So that's the request check, the 
Quest Tracker uh, application that's on our city's website at coldwater.org. Uh, we do have our last Entertainment Under the Stars uh, coming up. It was the reschedule from earlier in July, coming up uh, tomorrow. And that's um, going to be oh, Bittersweet Nights. I'm sorry, I lost my, lost my uh, place in my manager's report. And that's being uh, sponsored by Sekasui Boltec. So this was rescheduled after the rain out in, pre in early July. And then lastly, just wanted to raise attention to the fact that, um, that fundraising is underway for the restoration of uh, one of the naval guns that used to be displayed in front of the Michigan National Guard Armory and more recently was in Four Corners Park. That military artifact has since been removed and is in storage, but uh, through the Military Memorials Fund at the Branch County Community Foundation, uh, we're raising money to restore that particular piece of equipment. And so persons interested in that and history uh, can make donations to the Branch County Community Foundation Military Memorials Fund. And so that, in addition to the prior artifacts that have been restored, have been a collaborative effort between the city and private donations. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll keep it short. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to answer them. You mentioned the Fort Carter Park. Do you know a uh, time frame for when the renovation of Fort Carter Park might begin? So the plan is still to get the bids out this month, um, nearing completion on the construction plans and the bidding documents. Bring it to you hopefully in uh, the first, uh, not the first, the second meeting in September, and then if awarded, <coughs> then it would could work could begin yet this fall and into next spring. Anyone else have any questions for Keith? Mm -hmm. Not any motion to approve the city manager report, please. Motion to approve the report. I'll support that again, Your Honor. We have motion and we have support. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Vote. <coughs> motion carried. Number 11, a letter from Megan regarding updating our noise ordinance. Um, <coughs> Megan, do you want to leave with this? Sure, So um, there was some interest expressed in uh, expanding on the noise restrictions that we already have in our city ordinances. And I looked at a lot of other municipalities and uh, I present this to you uh, really as a starting point for discussion. If you have the other things that you would like to see happen, you'd like to see more detailed listings of kinds of noise or want to change the time during which the quiet time from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. I also have seen midnight to 6 a.m. I've seen other different things but that would be any area which you might want to address with changes. I wrote this to just tuck it into our uh, general ordinances uh, chapter 660 which makes it a misdemeanor. It wouldn't have to be a misdemeanor. You could choose. So our misdemeanors are 90-day misdemeanors with a maximum $500 fine. And realistically, when we go to court, normally we see maybe a $100 fine. I've never seen a $500 fine, but that's in the discretion of the judge. Um, and also, again, up to 90 days. There might be frequently with our kinds of misdemeanors, we'll see 30 days suspended on the condition that the defendant, uh, and this is following conviction, that the defendant not have any other similar conviction over the next year. That's a pretty typical outcome in terms of sentencing after we get a conviction. So a, mist a misdemeanor would have potential jail time, whereas a civil infraction would just be a fine, like a speeding ticket or a parking ticket with a fine schedule set by you. So um, I, I guess I have a PowerPoint for you if you'd like me to go through it, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this if it's not something that you'd like to uh, open up and explore further. Um, I, the PowerPoint does nothing other than summarize um, what I put into the letter. So would you like me to go through the PowerPoint or do you want to engage in a discussion yourselves? Let's see what the, as we all may know, that, uh, initiated with a very annoying neighborhood situation that we all want to help. Um, I guess the question for the nine of us is, 
legislation, is that a good way to deal with a neighborhood problem? And I, I don't, can't answer for anybody but myself. But uh, if we want, we can certainly go through the PowerPoint if we all want to, or anybody wants to. I don't know if there, how much support there is. My experience, we try to legislate for a specific situation. We tend to sometimes fail. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Are you, Megan, do you have any personal recommendation? You're the one that has to enforce these. We have dealt with noise in the city for 100 years. Uh, do we need more tools? Or is just, I have a real problem. I agree with Mr. Lindsay. I mean, I was at the 4-H fair. And I'm a neighbor around there when they did the track. I don't know what would be a stop some of the neighbor of calling up and saying, and then so then we have discretion, well, that's the fair, so we let them disturb right. our sleep. I mean, right, and then we're always in a bad position when we're picking and choosing who we're going to prosecute because we don't want to be in that position, and it certainly doesn't feel good to our populace if we're picking and choosing who we're going to prosecute. You could build something into a noise ordinance that says that any city or County sanctioned event would be exempt from your noise ordinance. That's a possibility if you wanted to address that. When we're doing this, we're always balancing the rights of people, especially people in when they're in their homes, because that's a big deal. And our court takes the the sanctity of a person's home pretty strongly. I mean, what happens in a home is, I mean, I hate to say it, but a man's home is his castle. A woman's home is her castle. But um, we're always balancing the interests of some citizens in peace and quiet in other citizens who um, might need to make noise. One of the areas that troubles me personally is snowblowers. So potentially, we're saying to people who work uh, second shift that they can't go home and do their snow blowing at after 11 p.m. and maybe somebody in their household has to get up, get out at 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. and there's not enough time. I mean, there's a lot of factors that you have to consider how a noise ordinance is going to impact. I guess maybe what I would want to do, and it's always reasonable, is to always put a play in here. What is reasonable? What is an unreasonable amount of noise? For me, as a prosecutor, when I have uh, people who are intoxicated and going up somebody's street at 2 o'clock in the morning shouting obscenities uh, and uh, maybe having uh, a dispute between a guy and a girl or something, for me, that's unreasonable when it gets other people awake and, and the police are called and the intoxicated people are still there. Um, and we, can't, we don't prosecute people for being intoxicated. That's a status, and it's not an offense. But we can prosecute them for their behavior when they're intoxicated. Driving is an example, and these noise ordinances, these disturbing the peace type things are examples. I guess I would say, if we're going to go down this alley at all, do you want to see these as crimes that are punishable by um, imprisonment, plus a fine, and the people are entitled to a jury trial? Or do you want to see these done as civil infractions if we're going to move into this at all? Do we have any any response to that? I think it's a civil infraction. I think. You I think, think it should be a civil infraction? more reasonable way to do it. Okay. Yeah. Civil infraction. So yeah. justifying. I would say civil infraction. One of the things the mayor brought up is we're on far east end of town. Every Friday night when there's a football game or a sports event, we can hear it all the way across town. Hmm. I know it's hard to draft law for <clears throat> every situation. The snowballing, I think that was something I actually had brought up. I used to be home from work at 10, 11 o'clock at night, and then I switched shifts, and I'd leave at 5.30 in the morning, so my wife and kids figured out I had to blow the snow. Uh, is, is there, I'd ask you this, is there a way to learn, I don't say, an emergency use of, I mean, snow, you don't have to cut your grass at 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't think I've ever had that. No. But but I mean, where you could take it as account for uh, safety, the snow needs to be blown for safety. Um, uh, public events, which would be like a school function, um, and um, Mr. Lindsay's concerns with this cons. If you're if you're a business, I mean, if we had a bar downtown with a band and the uh, windows open on a hot summer night, yes. That's going to be annoying, but, but then again, that's in a business district. 
Well, we're not distinguishing here between residential districts and business districts. Right, and so that's what I'm asking is could we, if we're going to do this, is that something you, something you may want to consider? That a, a, something that's certified as a business may we extend their time till midnight, I would think? We're good with the time. We just wanted to say between 11 and 7 a.m., not particularly and leave it open for interpretation. Well, problem. I think there you've got people who would be saying, and I didn't realize it, sorry. I think there the concern would be that <coughs> having somebody blasting their, well, having a kid in the garage blasting the electric guitar to an amplifier at 10 o'clock is disturbing as don't well. We have, don't we have rules and laws to deal with? We've been dealing with that for the last 50 years, 100 years. So that's my question is other than this incident that brought it up, but is, is our current worry in ordinance been adequate? If it is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But I remember over the years some of the complaints I've had from other neighbors and, and people that I know. One was a guy who had a monster truck with great big tires on it and straight exhaust, and he left the work at 4 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and he fired up and let it run in the winter for half an hour to wake up this area that people complained about. And the person told me they had called the police, but the, the police stopped and said, you're annoying people, could you not do that? And he said, I got to warm my truck up, and I, I started up and I got in the shower. And I had a personality driver out on East West Chicago, same thing, he had to go to work, he had to leave at four in the morning, he asked to warm his truck up. Right. The neighbor, I mean, we have a lot of second and third shift people in this community that work at the prison, at the distribution center, at factories. You know, I just... But then we also had the neighbor that would take their sound system outside of their house at 12 o'clock at night and fire up a five, six hundred watt system. But we've and always had that, Jim. We've, we've always, always had, had we've been able to prosecute. Right. For some I, reason. I think we leave it as a civil infraction. It can still foster that good neighborly. Right. You know, and, and we as a city have a neighbor as well. So we, we try to balance individual rights and public order. And so if you think about the things that cause noise that are a necessity, a snowblower at 11 o'clock at night, because we have an ordinance saying you have to keep your sidewalk clear. So to comply with that ordinance, it may be the only time you can do it is 11 o'clock at night. We have um, it, things like a, a garage door open and a, a teenager practicing band practice. That's not a necessity. That's a consideration that you can then do it at a different time. But running a snowblower, a lawnmower maybe at 7 o'clock because you have to leave for the week and to go to the lake and it's going to rain you don't want to get a ticket for all grass. And there's certain things that can be considered natural. You're a homeowner. We have to do these things versus. But who decides? Jim's going to want to do it as snowball. He's got two inches of snow and he decides to do it. And he wakes you up because he didn't really need to do it. But he said, hey, I got a snowball. It's two inches. It's four inches. It's, I mean, you're still leaving a lot of. That's what she's trying to say. I think there's still discretion. I know. And, and sometimes it comes down to even the person. I, I as a neighbor, have been woken up numerous times by neighbors. But when it's the sound of. Gee, it sucks they choose to do their lawn right now. Right. Right. What if somebody else lived in my house that didn't work the hours that I worked? Right. It wouldn't be an issue. So, I mean, sometimes it's a matter of it, it sucks that I hear this noise. I mean, trucks that go down in US 12 and hit the, the, uh, the, the race at midnight. The hospital, I'm sure, has an issue with that. Um, but you can't enforce that because what do you do? Catch up to them? So, I mean, there's things we can't help, there's things that we can. If somebody's intentionally causing noise, like a loud party, a uh, house party, that's an well, issue. We can deal with that now under just the What does this do that we don't have already? So if we don't even need a civil infraction, we leave it as it is. I say so leave it as it is. Well, so then, <clears> so <throat> when we get to that, what started off, we got to go back to what started off this also, was weren't we told that they needed more teeth in the ordinance? Well, we had an officer tell a, 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 a citizen that, but we're trying to find out if that's you know, appropriate. Well, that's what I'm asking for. But for the pavement with a pass, pass lot here, are we still discretion though, Jimmy? You know, no, but I mean, we could tweak it. We could tweak our ordinance. We don't have to, right? Unfortunately, you know, wrap it all up. I mean, is is there it, to just walk away from the issue completely? Is there something that should, could or should be adjusted that would help, or does that mean that we don't need it? I think one of the problems is that we we're trying to fix one. Problem. And so then we've started adding in and saying, well, this situation might happen or that situation. We've had an ordinance. It has worked well 
except for this warm situation? Is there not something else other than a noise ordinance that could possibly be looked at that would deal with, I mean, when you've got a neighbor that is not a nice neighbor, is there not something else other than just noise that could be looked into rather than completely revamping, coming up with something that I agree with Mike if it's not broke? Why are we trying to trying to re reinvent the wheel when we've got a wheel that seems so far to be working okay except for this one situation? You have Joe here if you guys want to hear from uh, Joe in terms of the guy that's got a deal with it. how we're addressing other situations, obviously. If they're vehicle related, there's provisions for that. If there's noise situations currently that could be explained as disturbing the peace or being enforced in that manner, but that's we're not the first ones to have had this discussion. I know <coughs> both the city and the county over the years have, have had this discussion. So uh, this attempts to further define that or refine that based on the, the direction we received. But um, you know, other examples that I know that I've received complaints on when I was in neighborhood services were, you know, if, if the garbage is being collected too soon in the morning or if um, construction, you know, construction site. You know, to what extent uh, do you make provisions for that? So, Joe, if you wouldn't mind coming forward just to be available for any questions. He's rather than Keith, though. What's your, what's, can we get your, your opinion on Keith? I mean, you're, you're in the pinnacle of this. I mean, I think one, I think what started to go through was several people that said, you know, Keith, you were in that city, you were your guy. So I, I agree with John. Mm -hmm. See this ping pong game going, you know. I mean, I live in neighbors are all tires in my backyard. They start up changing tires. I don't have a problem with it. They're business. At a minimum, it does. What we currently don't have is any type of provision as to what ex, what um, expresses potentially a, an unreasonable time. If you want to call that between 11 and 7. Um, we don't have the time factor in our current ordinance. Um, you know, we. we Megan has further defined various types of um, noises that would be subject to enforcement. We need an honest upfront response from you. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so I'll give you my best that I can uh, offer here. Um, we have had an ordinance for a disorderly code statute. We do enforce regularly. Um, when it comes down to this specific instance, um, the, I think everybody is pretty clear with what we're talking about. A lot of the violations are very minor. Um, I realize they're still um, causing some uh, unrest in the neighborhood. So I have a lot of times I have a police officer going out there trying to deconflict the situation. And um, it's a, you know, if you're going to take away somebody's freedom and they're going to take them to a jail for a violation, you want to make sure you have a good, solid violation. I think Megan would agree that we don't want to bring cases into the courses that are not strong. So some of the cases or some of the instances of this specific incident were very minor that I had police officers went out and trying to deconflict those and try to minimize those. Um, and I think that's really where some of the feedback came back with the ordinance is um, clear. Um, since then I tried to give some uh, better instruction by police officers that updated them that the ordinances that we do have and there are ordinances out there that we can enforce, but we just want to make sure we have good strong cases um, if we're going to bring those to a uh, prosecution level. And some of the cases down in this instance, almost that they were very minor, do we really want to get to that problem? So that makes sense, everybody. So, your, your opinion, do you think we need to do anything or not? Um, my personal opinion, I would be more with the mayor. I think we have a good enough set of rules that in place that we can use to enforce the, the people that are purposely trying to violate the parties, the loud music. The people that are out there potentially trying to kind of cause disrespect or disrespect. Now, the tougher ones are the snowblowers, the starting up trucks. I don't think that people are purposely trying to cause criminal uh, events, but uh, they are probably still disrupting their neighbors. And those ones, I don't, I don't know if we really want to move that type of behavior into a criminal. Um, I don't think a magnet would really support that. Whatever you didn't want to do, nine of us, so there are nine opinions here. Uh, I guess. Uh, well, I don't have to enforce it. I just deal with it myself, so. 
That's something you think you would want to embark on an amendment to the ordinance, and I think we would go ahead with the presentation. If it cumulatively you wouldn't embark on an ordinance, then forego the presentation. Let's move on. Let's move to table this at this time. We can revisit it in the future if there's a necessity. I'd like to make that as a formal motion. Support. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. Uh, I guess so we have a motion to uh, defer this for the time being. Right? Unless, let's see what happens, I guess. We have a motion to uh, not sure table, because that means we'll bring it up at a later date. We'll it postpone it definitely. Postpone it definitely. We'll do that, both of you. Very good. And we'll see what happens. So, any other comments before we vote? That's probably a good idea rather than rushing into this or <laughs> Can't legislate good behavior. Right? I think that's the bottom line. So we have a motion to table this indefinitely. All in favor, say aye, please. Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. <clears throat> noise ordinance. There's no more noise on that for a while, Joe. <laughs> Number twelve. A letter from Megan regarding a tree ordinance. <laughs> <laughs> assist you with this as well because this is something that I experienced in downstairs in neighborhood services. So in as much as we knew we were going to be bringing the noise ordinance to you, uh, I'd ask Megan to uh, research and prepare something relative to this. And there was a recent example of this situation too whereby two property owners uh, became a situation as to who would be responsible for a downed tree that was posing a, a danger or that could pose a danger to its adjoining uh, neighbor's <coughs> property. And it is something that is uh, that uh, we do receive in neighborhood services occasionally uh, as it relates to if it's a private tree and either it's damaged or diseased and either threatens to uh, to cause damage on a neighboring property private property and then and or does cause damage like during the recent storm uh, to what extent is there any response that the city can provide and that's what we and looking at this is bringing forward to you if we were to do that because this as proposed would be extending that government reach would be extending that regulation from our court, current ordinance regulates trees that threaten public property so if you have a private tree that looks like it's going to fall into the street um, blocks the sidewalk from access those type of things or is diseased and could be causing if it harbors the gypsy moth or the ML ash borer and so it needs to be treated, we can we can accommodate that. Our ordinance provides for uh, the ability to address that. But this would then be taking the next step as to intervening between uh, two property owners as to what currently is a civil matter um, as to whether or not a damaged or diseased tree could or could not threaten a private adjacent private property and whether or not the city should have any responsibility in um, Siting and, and or causing the action or removal of that tree or the trimming of that tree to alleviate the threat. Okay, clear the bell. Uh, Megan, do you want to? Sure. Um, and the common law is pretty clear. The tree growing on your neighbor's property that has a branch that reaches over into your property, you have the right and responsibility of trimming that branch where it touches the property, where it crosses the parking line. That's totally your right and your responsibility to take care of it. Because it's your property. You're taking care of your property. That shifts if your neighbor has ignored a tree that's dying or is dead and knew or should have known that the tree was dead and posing a hazard to your property and the tree does fall. But all of this is taken care of first by insurance, if you have insurance, if you have homeowner's insurance, and everybody who has a mortgage has homeowner's insurance. And the homeowner's insurance will assist you, subject to the deductible that you get and are paying for, with the tree that falls or the branch that falls in your yard. If you haven't got homeowner's insurance, you're not in a very good position to take care of the problem. I'm sure you've removed trees, they're very expensive to have a full size tree. What this would do, would it would put the city in that 
relationship. Currently, the question of whether the tree owner, the guy who's, who's got the trunk in his yard, whether he has violated his duty to keep the neighbor safe is something that's decided by a court. You have to go to court and get do a, a negligence action and get a judgment. And your insurance company, if you have one, might, under certain circumstances, do that. For example, if a neighbor's tree falls on your house and costs $30,000 worth of damage, well, your homeowner's insurance is going to be interested in getting in there and getting somebody else who will pay. But by and large, I think what you really have to ask here is, do you want to step into that kind of settled relationship of our trees and provide a remedy or a relief for neighbors whose other neighbor's tree has damaged their property? Um, or actually what this does is it puts us in the position of policing those trees. We, I concluded that we have no authority to order the tree owner to pay for the damage to his neighbor's property. There's, there's not an authority for that. But we could go out and police trees in yards. We could um, send our building inspector, I guess, every time there's a complaint that my neighbor's tree is dying or is dead or I don't like the way the branch looks and it's reaching over into my yard. And we could do um, take them, but that's probably not going to be too powerful. Or we could, if after we the notice to remove the branch of the tree, we could structure it so we could go in and cut the tree. But again, that's going to be expensive. We already spent a lot of money remediating lawns. Um, and individually, they're not so expensive. They're about $60 a mow, more or less, in that range, depending on how much time is spent. But getting a contractor to go into somebody's backyard and drop the tree, a person who doesn't hasn't asked for this, and drop the tree right between the pool and the pool house, or you know, whatever configuration of, of problems there are in dropping a particular tree, I think we're gonna have a hard time getting contractors who will do that. So, so go ahead. Well, I was just gonna add that from staff's perspective, I don't necessarily think that we want to go down this road, but we wanted to have this discussion that in the event that either we did solidify and um, include that provision within the ordinance and that it became adopted, or if not, then we could then uh, have the, the, uh, the standing by which we can explain that it had been discussed and it had uh, chosen not to move forward. So I think we wanted to be able to explain that the discussion had taken place and that the, that the council had had not supported going in, in the, to that extent <coughs> of regulating private trees on private property. Anyone have any questions for Megan or Keith? I hate to even mention, but um, trees are really noisy when you come down. <laughs> <laughs> really? I'm just saying, really? <laughs> when can you cut down a tree? <laughs> you have a long agenda, you really can do that. <laughs> Is there anyone? Was interested in making a motion to introduce Ordinance 822. If not, we're going to move on to 13, a letter from Keith Baker regarding the establishment of a neighborhood improvement authority for Thompson Boulevard. Keith, this is interesting. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, yes, it is a, a new concept. It's not a new concept in how it's implemented, but it would be new in its application uh, to a neighborhood uh, area. It's uh, something that's been provided for under state law in identifying a uh, particular neighborhood in which we have some development taking place. We have quite a few, uh, with the potential for quite a few new homes to go in that we thought maybe this would be an opportunity to, to incorporate this, um, this authority by which we could then do other as, as uh, those properties develop as the incremental uh, values of properties within the proposed neighborhood uh, would um, increase, that we could then capture those uh, values and reinvest them in that neighborhood. And with that, um, Cam Miller, we have a presentation for you, but this is a, operates much like a downtown development authority or a tax increment financing district. And there again, we have a presentation for you uh, 
To some extent, it serves as his um, final report as being an intern in the city manager's office, uh, as he's done the majority of the research and put the presentation together. But also, we wanted to bring it forward to you to uh, hopefully look at the opportunity for uh, work within that neighborhood uh, based on the fact that we've got um, improvements that will be coming forward and um, means by which we could finance future improvements to that area if there's something like this were to be put in place. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Cam to, to begin the presentation and then we'll tag team this along the way. Good evening, of course, the mayor and members of the council. Uh, my name is Cam Miller, as Mr. Baker said. Uh, I've had the privilege uh, this summer of interning for him. Um, tonight I'll be outlining a project that will be a beneficial tool in the development and growth of our community. Um, the ultimate goal of this project is to recoup our finances for the extension of Thompson Boulevard and to provide a fund for the betterment and enhancement for that neighborhood. Next slide. Okay. Last slide. Um, the State of Michigan under Public Act 57 of 2018, the Recode of Pipe Tax and Increment Financing Act, has allowed for neighborhood improvement authorities to be implemented in order to optimize neighborhood redevelopment. And NIA is an important asset for communities to use in order to help in economic development and redevelopment in residential neighborhoods. This authority is allowed to use its funds, including tax increment financing, to fund residential economic growth. This residential, ec this residential growth can be supported through construction of housing, streets, rights of ways, beautification, parks, recreational facilities, utility infrastructure, access routes, and others. And I work similar to the DDA, various TIF districts, and the Local Development Finance Authority um, these similarities are in terms of how taxes are collected by establishing an initial base value and capturing the improved value through the organization of the boards and also by the creation of development plans. The accrued tax increments do not increase taxes but rather reassign these collections into an NIA fund that can only be used towards improvements for the designated NIA district. Next slide, please. Continuing on, the steps for approval for a neighborhood improvement authority go as follows. Our initial step in the creation of the NIA begins tonight where our staff is seeking approval of a resolution of intent. This will allow us to move forward with a mandatory public hearing for all taxpayers within the proposed district. Um, at this public hearing, the City Council may vote on an ordinance to establish, establish the district. After 60 days, the City Council may adopt by resolution the creation of the Neighborhood Improvement Authority. And after this creation of the authority, we would continue forward with the establishment of the NIA Board. The Board would be proposed by the Mayor, subject to the City Council's approval. Our staff encourages a five-member Board, but can include a maximum of nine members. The Board is mandated by state law to include the Mayor or his designee, a Council Board member, a District Landowner, and two residents of the designated district. Next slide, please. As, de as described in Public Act 57, city staff must prepare a development plan and tax increment financing plan. The development plan would describe various costs, location, resources, and proposed product projects for the district. The tax increment financing plan would specify the tax increment plan along with the maximum amount of bonded indebtedness and the span of the program, the maximum being 30 years. For final adoption of the NIA plan, the Neighborhood Improvement Authority Board must provide a recommendation and City Council must approve. And Dean Walrack will continue on to provide a more detailed explanation of our proposed district. Thank you for your time. So we were proposing a district um, around Thompson Boulevard, uh, Mike Drive area. Um, it includes 145 taxable parcels. Um, the average taxable value of this district is $41,280. And uh, the majority of this district is zone A1, which is one family residential zoning. There's a one parcel, this is a significantly sized parcel that's zoned uh, AA, which is one family agricultural uh, district. It's adjacent to Trail Tree Village. Um, Trail <coughs> Can we go on to the next slide? Um, this is a map of the district that we're looking at. Um, we chose the extent of this district um, primarily by the parcels that would primarily benefit from the improvements we're recommending. Uh, the extension of Thompson Boulevard, um, some potential parks, trailways. Uh, this neighborhood is, most of it is kind of 
insular in that the design of the, the street network, but these parcels are the ones that would primarily benefit from those improvements. We go on to the next slide. Um, we have the project tax capture. Um, this is an area that our, our city assessor was kind of better versed in um, kind of going through, but she's not able to be here tonight, so I'm going to kind of struggle on with it. Um, what we are doing is looking at capping the taxable value that would go into the city's general fund and then additional uh, tax value over the uh, course of the 20 years or 30 years of the tax plan, of the um, NIA plan, would then go into the fund for the NIA itself. So it, it operates much like the EDA does, the LDFAs, or the, uh, the TIF districts. Um, I believe we go on to the next. Okay. This slide shows the, um, the potential levy that we'd be looking at. Um, if we use the 2020-2021 um, as the kind of beginning year, we would, we would cap all those values, and that district itself would produce, I think I'm on the wrong slide. Can, can we go back to the previous slide? I apologize. I got my uh, slides backwards. So this, would sh this shows the initial taxable value being $5,944,000. Um, we're estimating 10 years of new construction of houses, two houses per year, the house is having a $210,000 um, taxable value, or value rather. So the, the taxable value would be 210,000 for the two houses, since so taxable value is half of the assessed value. So at the end of the, the plan, we're, we're showing this as a 20 year plan. The tax value that would still be taxed for the city's general fund would be that same $5,944,000. The tax value, the column on the right shows the capture that would start going to fund that NIA district. So the first year we'd be looking at $333,000 of cap of taxable value. So that's not the actual value in that pot of money, it's just the value that the taxation would kind of go toward to build that fund up. What percent is that then recouped? I you know so it anticipates a two percent <coughs> increase per year. But on the next on the next slide he'll show what that what that means in real dollars. Yeah. As far as of that three hundred and thirty three thousand dollars what what that would equate to in what the, uh, based on the city's uh, and the county's millage rates would capture uh, for that particular year. So if we go on to the next slide, this, this is a good transition into that. This shows where the, uh, what the potential levy of that would be. So the first year we'd be looking at about uh, $7,500 in value, or in money that would go into that kind of pot of money. And that increases year over year, showing the uh, that addition of two hundred and ten thousand dollars of taxable value assumed each year with the new construction of two new homes, and then the two percent inflationary rate as well. So by the end of it, in twenty years, we'd be looking at um, the final year, one hundred thirty-six thousand dollars of of capture. But um, the very bottom shows the addition of that over all those years. Of it. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, so the funding of this district is uh, can be accomplished by donations to the district, revenue bonds, revenue from buildings or properties owned or leased by the district. The district would be able to own the property much like the EDA is able to. I, I'm not suggesting that that would happen in this case. This is, these are just the revenue streams kind of enabled by this change of state law. Um, a, a bit of information that I forgot to kind of hit on the, the last discussion was the, the kind of pots of money where we'd be able to capture value from. This includes certain other other pots of, or other millages beyond just the general fund millage. So it includes um, the Commission on Aging Fund for these parcels within this property, uh, 911, jail, beta, library, veterans, um, affairs, the uh, the community the community schools 
as well. So those are different cost money that could be wrapped into this fund. Um, those entities that currently collect those funds have, would have the opportunity to either opt in and let us collect those funds to construct these improvements to the district with the kind of idea of being at the end of this, this, this uh, plan, the improvements will have increased the taxable value so much that it makes them all in the, in the long view. Um, they could opt in for a percentage, so it could be 50-50, the district gets 50% of their millage, they keep 50% or 25, 75, or they could opt out entirely. So one of the advantages here is that we'd be able to use some of those other cost of money um, on these improvements. Um, we go on to the next slide. Um, potential projects include the Thompson Boulevard construction, the repaving of the streets within the district, um, the establishment of a new park perhaps, um, installation of sidewalks and trails. Um, some of these objectives are outlined in our master plan that it you know, encourages residential infill, um, building out our non-motorized networks, um, so we can achieve some of those objectives uh, through using this formula. Do you, do you know if uh, you're able to acquire land with this fund? You yes, they could. Yeah, you could. You could purchase additional land with these right. dollars. Yep. And then can we mix current city money, say we wanted uh, something recreation from a park or something, or we can use funds and from inside and outside? Definitely, just like the, the proposed Four Corners project where you've got DDA funds and general funds being proposed for that. So yeah, if a project were in excess of what the NIA could afford uh, to facilitate, then you could, in addition to grants or other funding sources. Yeah. You know, because it would take a long time to build, would we be looking at this as 10 years from now when money starts to build, we would be looking at projects, or is there a way to borrow against? Um, one of those, you could do that, you could do a, a revenue bond to to do that, much like a DDA or LDFA has too, if you if you could show that you had that means, otherwise then the city would be back so backstopping that. You only capture on the new development, so for example, Jim's house in that district goes up 2%, the taxes oh. go up, okay, 5%. <laughs> you, you capture that 2% on the existing property, or 1%, or so all the... We, we, we cap the taxable value that goes to the general fund at the, 2019, 2020. So the increase, and so the 2% increase, that 2% would go into this NIA fund. So the city would only be collecting into the general fund the same amount. The, the, the kind of logic's always been that you're not taking away from the city to do, to do these improvements. So this fund wouldn't just, if you did a one house a year, a $210,000 house for 10 years, it's not just the revenue from those 10 houses, potentially, it's also the revenue on the increase on all the houses yep. in this district. We, we assume a 2% increase on all the parcels within the district. Those um, 136,000 that Deb forecast includes the new houses and the increase on yep. all the houses. This district. would also include improvements to the house, so if they build a new garage okay. or something that adds value to that property, um, that would be included in this capture. Um, and none of that would be included in the general fund, essentially. It would be make, you know, making this fund grow faster. Um, sales, where a property becomes on cap, right. that addition would go into the, the NIA fund. And Which isn't provided for in this projection. Right, there's no way to tell. And I know the answer to this, but this does not mean an increase on taxes on anybody in there. It's just redistribution. Correct. This is not the city gaining any taxes per se, we're gaining it in right. the fund. It's not taking away from the city taxes. We will still get our regular taxes. It's tapping the amount that the city receives from that neighborhood at this level. Um, and it doesn't increase taxes for the people within the district, it just reallocates how, where, those tax, where that additional tax goes. Right. The tax is in 20 years. 20 years is what we're proposing. Um, it effectively ends when the improve when the when the 
plan doesn't need to be in effect any longer. If, if we lay out projects that we want to accomplish, and those get accomplished in less than 20 years, it could be dissolved in less than 20 years. Um, there's a statutory review period at which I think it's five years. Every five years, the board has to reassess where it is um, in the <coughs> plans. And if we went with this idea that 10 or 15, 10 years from now, we would dissolve it, is that then we could move this to another area in the city? I'm looking for feedback. You could, you could definitely, well, you, you even, you could have multiple ones. Um, you could target if a particular area you felt needed some um, assistance and some priority or focus, you could implement it there. Um, this area was identified specifically because uh, we, it is an area that will be growing uh, very soon and has some projects already planned and um, if captured could be utilized to do other projects within that area. Good, Good question. Are there questions to being on? What happens if we have a downturn in the economy, it's capped, and what happens if their values go underneath the cap? I mean, you, as, as long as you didn't bond indebtedness for it, then it just wouldn't capture it. Um, if, you bonded, if you bonded and pledged the, the value of that capture against a, a debt payment, then you're going to be in the city zone. Any questions for Dean or Pete? Nice project. Yeah, I think you got a wrap, a wrap up. Can you invest the money for it that's not being used? Can it be in we can Well, with very limited. The finance director can get it in the, the, the municipal pool, but other than that, yeah. No. I sat for the bill the first few years. Dean, are you wrapped up on that? Yeah, I'm wrapping up. And I, I'm not sure. I, mean, I think this is. Yeah, so ultimately, I could. Um, so ultimately, yes, this is a, a new concept uh, in that we would apply it to a residential area. It um, works up, like we've discussed, similar to DD and TIFs, and uh, all that this particular request would do in the resolution 9, 1955 would be the first step in going down this road. Scheduling a public hearing in which it would be considered, uh, and um, there's many steps as Kim uh, laid out along the way in which we could decide to move forward or not. But uh, getting, this is essentially your initial reaction to the idea and setting a public hearing in which to consider it further at the next meeting or the meeting in September. Or, um, I'm in favor of putting it on the public in the form of a hearing, so my motion to be to do so. Your motion would be to adopt resolution 1955 and schedule a public hearing for September 23rd. Yes, sir. This is a wonderful motion. We have support for that. <clears throat> support. Any final questions? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Mayor, I believe I should abstain because I sit on the ISD board and I think this will happen. Because I have a fiduciary yeah. responsibility here as well as a fiduciary yeah. responsibility there. Bill Cogler. Hmm? No conflict. You sure? There's no capture. There's no capture in schools. Okay. Aye. <laughs> okay. Do have one more time. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Everybody opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Cam. Nice job. Dean, thank you. Number 14, we're to Keith Baker regarding MDOT contract. Keith. I think this is the third time we've talked about this. So this is the formal adoption of the contract between MDOT and the city for the grant funds that would uh, assist in funding on the reconstruction of Allen Avenue. I mean, we just ask uh, your approval of resolution 1954. There again, the grant is in the amount of just over $169,000. And uh, at this point, we estimate the project in the neighborhood of $237,000. So bids are currently out for this, for this particular project and are due back on August 23rd. <laughs> Motion to approve resolution number 1954. Support. Thank you. We have a motion that we have support. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Everybody opposed? Motion carried. Number 15, a letter from Keith regarding temporary traffic change. Order one way, North Hanchet from US 12 to Harrison Street. Keith. 
Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, this resolution, as you noted, would uh, change the traffic uh, for North Hanchet uh, from two-way to one-way from US 12 to Harrison, uh, specifically for the purpose to address the loss of parking during the lofts of Milnes Plaza a construction project uh, where the new apartment uh, project is uh, currently underway. Uh, this would add 12, 13 uh, additional parallel parking stalls on Hanchet uh, to help offset some of those lofts during the course of construction. It was taken last week to the a DDA board for their feedback and um, ultimately approval. They did pass a, a motion to recommend approval for that. This would be temporary, much like what we did for South Monroe Street, uh, whereby we made a change to uh, the street to accommodate some additional parking during the course of construction of the uh, Chandler parking lot and um, then reevaluated uh, after construction was complete. So I know that there's already been discussion about would this be uh, put in permanently, and um, at this point, no, we're not asking for that. And I think you have to look at the experience that you would have over the next year as to whether or not that would be advisable. And, you know, each block is different from an access and utilization standpoint, but uh, at this point, we're asking for the temporary uh, change in uh, traffic flow for Hanchet uh, from a two way to one way northbound. Question? Pleasure. I move we accept the resolution 1956 to make it a one-way street. Order. Thank you, Randall Scott. Any final discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Do we have opposed to it? Motion carried. Number 16, a letter from Keith regarding uh, two more traffic changes. Keith? So this has my name on it, but I'm going to also ask the director to come forward and uh, provide some, uh, some support in this would look at restricting parking on the east side of North Shore Drive. This is resolution 1958. Uh, as now with the Little League Fields having completed its first season, uh, we've obviously realized a parking issue on North Shore Drive. Uh, as it's currently not prohibited, we've had parking both on the east and west sides which can restrict the flow of traffic on North Shore Drive. And um, this would provide for it on the west side, which is the side adjacent to the actual fields, uh, but would restrict it on the east side uh, so that you can provide for better uh, vehicle access and to uh, keep people from having to cross the street uh, in a dangerous situation. Subsequent uh, also to the uh, completion of the lovely season uh, we have um, opened up uh, the defense line on the, uh, at the dog park between the two sides of the dog park so now that there is a, a physical connection to uh, the parking the gravel parking for the dog park or the parking that gets utilized for um, various events out there whether it be uh, civil war days or um, the fireworks but you can now park there and walk straight through uh, to the Little League field. So we helped shorten that walk, and I think we'll, uh, ultimately over time we'll put a sidewalk in there as well, but that is now physically open where you can park on the south side of the dog park and uh, after a short short walk get to the Little League field. So that will help facilitate better parking in that area as well. But this will um, provide for parking on the west side, but uh, restrict parking on the east side uh, for those that are primarily there for, um, for the Little League fields but also we experienced it during the situations like fireworks where we put up temporary um, parking restrictions and some other events like uh, Civil War Days. Nice job, Joe. Yeah, well, he can, he can attest to it. So. And he, and he, has, he has more history on the beat, so Western is good. Um, if you want to take them independently, we'll take them, you know, yeah, two resolutions, yes. Yeah. So. I, don't, I don't suspect there's no big debate on this one. Uh, the drift down there is dangerous, so are we all, anybody interested in discussing this in any more depth? Anybody interested in making a motion then? Uh, I'm going to do, uh, support resolution number 1955. Resolution 1958. Support. Okay. Any other questions? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Done. Uh, so this one, I am going 
going to defer to the acting director and to let him speak. Very good. So uh, recently, I took a complaint from a neighbor that lived up in the area of the all around Western and the Lynn Lane area. He uh, had some concerns about uh, through truck traffic and commercial traffic going down Western Ave, and he asked me whether we could take enforcement action up there. Um, I know from being here for a long time that there's signs that say no through truck traffic or no commercial traffic if you go down to the corner of uh, West Chicago Street and West Ave, and then there's also a sign up at Grand Street and uh, um, State Street up there. So I went back and tried to figure out if we had a traffic order in place. I talked to Sue, I talked to the, the clerks and Megan to try to find out if we had ever actually established a traffic order. Because if I wanted to uh, instruct my officers to take enforcement action, I want to make sure we had some form of a uh, backhoe or something to, uh, to, to get the site. And uh, we were not able to actually locate it. From what I understand, it was back in the 80s, um, before my time here. So um, after some discussion with the city manager, um, we thought it would be uh, maybe beneficial to go back and revisit this and get the traffic work. So, we can uh, take some type of enforcement action for um, through truck traffic, uh, commercial traffic. Uh, from what I understand, uh, I'm talking to people that was originally designed as a bypass, uh, but then they decided to build a neighborhood of a bunch of schools down there. Uh, with the, the, you know, a new school going in, I don't know if it's the best interest to have through truck traffic, uh, you know, down there every day, um, delivering, uh, or, you know, using that feed off the interstate. As we're not looking to, Forces on delivery trucks to schools and people are down there delivering goods with just the, the through truck traffic. So that's kind of the, how we got there. Question? My only question would be, Joe, that if we have certain streets signed, do we want to make an ordinance that's directed at two streets? Or do we want to make an ordinance if it's posted, then you could, if we have another road that's getting used. On the south side of town, or something becomes a concern, we can just post it and then it's enforceable. So, what is the question? My understanding of the Uniform Traffic Code, which gives the police chief the authority in the absence of a, an appointed um, traffic engine, we don't have a traffic engine office. Mm -hmm. So, it's the chief of police, and it needs to come through this process. It needs to be specifically approved by council. I don't think they can give a blanket approval without evaluating each set of circumstances. And also in this case, we have Brian Benzie's recommendation. It was a traffic study. You know, there's certain steps. So I think this is the way we have authority to do this. You just come back and add roles in. Yeah. How does this work with, um, I mean, for example, we have a construction going on right now. Mm -hmm. There's a new school. Not traffic, though. It's destination traffic. The, the complaint that I received specifically was uh, the, the Monroe Farms or the Mass Farms delivered the bales and that they were using that as a bypass in 2069. Was the, the neighbor said he saw a lot of trucks delivering produce as well as there. Questions? We should probably hear you. We're asking uh, to, okay, again, what you're going to do then is have traffic go through town and go north on 27 if they're headed uh, or all the way through town. Do you think they're using that bypass to go that way and then going north on 27 to the 69 exit? That's what I would speculate. Uh, to me, if, uh, where they're at, there, I don't know why they just went around down Garfield and take the business and the 69 exit. That might be a little bit farther for them, but it'd be easier to get to the interstate. I haven't seen a lot of big trucks use there, but that's going to be hard though, come on. You're talking about by Walmart and back up around and hard to get big trucks going through that lights and all the freezing No, it's not be taken out of our field at old 27 down the fender of the US. Correct. Yeah, that's, yeah. Correct. Yeah. that's, that's, that's what, what if I was driving and I had to get out there, right. that's what that's the way I would go or north as well. Same with anything to the north, right? But we have so, signs, we've had so, signs there forever. We right. have the red on the line, of course, they saw. <laughs> We're restating the legal ability or authority to, to enforce it if that were the case. So, so is this more this is more just north south traffic, not right. not people rolling down twelve, cutting off and going on. I don't believe so. And the, well, you have two schools there now. Yeah. We're gonna have two schools yeah. there. So. 
at a minimum, I think we want to discourage it. What you play the other game for adoption ordinance of resolution 1957? Motion to adopt. Okay, we have a motion. Support. We have support. Any final questions? Not all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Joe. We have a last spot on our agenda for public. One more. One more. Oh, Joe's still up. Oh, he wants to spend money. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I'm sorry, Hamilton Joe regarding approval for the purchase of new upgraded electronic door access system. Joe. Very good. So, um, last week we just had a lean audit, and uh, during the lean audit, uh, the auditor from the state came in and he looks at all of our lean records, and he also does a physical walk around of our building and looks at the security and locks and how we maintain our security. And he was kind of surprised to see that we still use push button codes and uh, keys, but uh, we have. And, Building from my understanding of building subjects, and I think it still has most all the original locking mechanisms out there, uh, which has served very well and have worked, you know, um, for a very long period of time. Uh, with that said, there are a couple things we've been starting to run into that uh, uh, cause some uh, expense for us. Every time we have a separation of an employee, um, we get stuck in pondering that maybe it's a favorable separation. We go back and recode those locks to maintain the integrity of our building. To maintain the integrity of our data, all those types of things, uh, which I think is very important. Um, so uh, we have uh, obviously data there, and then we have our employees. The um, uh, last thing I want to have somebody come back is disgruntled and, and come back and potentially cause some type of problem there. Uh, I believe all the current buildings right now in the city, or at least most of them, are using electronic access controls that uh, do a better job of monitoring. They're also a little bit easier to shut off or uh, rights uh, to the, you know, have a key card or a like, key pop type access. So uh, we talked to Pat Poole and he helped us uh, get some information around um, to get a bid around this. Um, he uh, suggested we go with the uh, continental access control, which are the current systems installed on all the city hall and the uh, rec department. Um, he advised it would be a lot easier to maintain the same equipment rather than to try to go get a, a totally outside vendor or a different uh, type of equipment that you would have to maintain basically two separate systems. Um, the current vendor who sells continental access control clearance lock is say out of Angola, and they provide a bid um, for the um, 16 doors um, that uh, basically control access in and out of our building um, at the cost of uh, $39,936. Is this in the budget? Is this something we Yes. Yep. We provided for it in the current fiscal year. Um, we did make Pat sit through the last hour and 15 minutes. So if you have any questions on the, on the technical IT side, um, we did want to acknowledge his um, availability. And because this is a sole source, because this particular vendor is the, the franchisee for our area, it's not as if you can get multiple bids on a specific piece of uh, equipment or um, system trying to match our current system. Right. Is there a backup if you lose power? Uh, my, from what I understand there is, and then we're going to also uh, like establish like a knock box or like a, a coded key box with a, a key that can override the system to get into the emergency. Um, um, Chief Smalls and I have already discussed this. Um, that we want to make sure we have access to uh, look at that. Does it come with any certain amount of time of support, technical support or anything before they start charging us? Oh, uh, that's a good question for Pat. I'm not aware of such a Pat. Pat, 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 So the question was that uh, did it come with any type of support to um, maintain um, the system or I guess? Like a 12 month support package and after 12 months they charge you an X amount per hour no, this is just a you know, device to get your ninety day support. Okay, how about the training for operation and all that? Get everybody up to speed. No training involved okay. because we've already used this system. Perfect. The other thing is, is that uh, Joe's a perfect example. Uh, we would buy two certain type of character cards. One get into his building and one get into this one. This is a convenient. Uh, the character card will whichever actually. 
who has ultimate control over the system? I think. I think what? We send out right for a lot of quarterly audits to do that back as to what There are a couple of exceptions that we did separately over there for their evidence um, where you didn't need really to do all the litigation. So the key card is one of them. Yeah, just so that the recording recording system can pick you up if you get closer to the mic. Okay. Sean. Yeah, so in two two places where they store evidence, we have dual authentication where they have to swipe the key and they have to uh, put it in code. And with that, does it record who exactly who swipes and at what time and time stamps? Yeah. And that log is uh, uneditable by us. In, is there a warranty on the equipment? There is a warranty on the equipment. I think it's too much. You've had good experience with We've been in this building for what, 10, 15 years? Yeah, so we've been using Lake Hill Park Comics uh, since I've been here in 2002. I don't know how much farther before that. Question? If not, we're looking for a motion to either adopt or not adopt Resolution 1957. Motion to adopt Resolution 1957. Support. Your okay. motion and support. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. We opposed? Well, it carried. Now, oh, thank you, Joe. Uh, we have a last spot on our agenda for public comments. Anyone would like to address the council? We have new unfinished business at council level. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you just want I got you a little quicker. You know, I keep on. It's a good cold. Hi, I'm Deborah G, and I have an apartment. Email that would keep me abreast of what was going on in that parking lot where I parked my cars at night. Is that started yet? I've not received, and I've talked to other people that have not received any emails regarding the updates. I just heard from one of the business owners that they're looking to close down the complete parking lot soon. But what is that? So, so no, I haven't. Um, but we do. We're also working with Second Story Marketing on doing a um, partner dust campaign. So I know they've been around once. I know the contractor's been around once. But um, but but we are we are developing an email blast. You know, we want to collect email addresses to the ones that were you know can be forwarded to us or that we're uh, aware of, like yours. I have yours, so uh, we keep you in the loop. Okay, and of um. Maybe the stuff that you're handing out to the business owners, you know, they're going down the street, if you could mail copies to the people, the residents that live there, to kind of keep us in the loop too, I'd really appreciate that. Good, good idea, thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any other public comments? Any unfinished business at council level? Before we talk about the closed session, any new business at council level? Now then we're uh, being asked to go into closed session pursuant to section 80 of Public Act 267.